It didn't happen in my 20s. Who cares? Now I've got all this fancy wisdom to share. Hey, I've got this baby. You're getting the best of me. Cause I'm a new mommy of 40. <laughs> Welcome to New Mommy at 40 a honest, informative, and non-judgmental podcast for those navigating to and through parenthood in their 40s. But before we get started, don't forget to follow, subscribe wherever you're listening to this so you don't miss a single episode. All right, let's get into it. Welcome to New Mommy at 40. Again, I'm your host, Victoria Latour Dunker, and it is my pleasure to have Michael Petrella here today, all the way from Colorado. And what I love about his story is, I think anyone listening, since we're either parents or going to be parents here, there's something to seeing a need, being concerned as a parent, and fulfilling that need, and not only helping your child, but so many more. And doctor, doctor, I always say doctor, I always feel like you should have something. <laughs> Michael Petrella, we, the reason why I have so much respect for this man, the personal story is I lost an uncle way before my time to drowning. And my parents were always so skittish about us being in the pool because of that experience. And I think it hindered me as a swimmer. So to see a parent like you, who's been so concerned and actually went and became the first instant infant swimming resource instructor in Michigan to become a master instructor, uh, teaching survival skills to children all over our country from Michigan to Los Angeles. And now where he resides in Colorado, uh, I just can't, uh, can't, can't contain my excitement for what you're going to share to everybody for everyone today so welcome michael thank you victoria uh that was an amazing introduction (laughs) i don't know that it's deserved but uh you can introduce me (laughs) well i'm available as soon as pre-k starts um which is september just hire me let me know i'd love to (laughs) no i think you know if anyone has uh come across your instagram page first of all it's just you see these kids doing these most amazing things, but then outside of just how great they're, they're swimming or they're, they're floating, they're turning. It's, you realize, wait, this is such a life-saving skill. And they're so young. Some of your students, how did you tell us the story about how this came about? What, what was your passion? How did you get started? I know your story. So I, (laughs) So I didn't, I don't have any swimming background. I remember taking a swim lesson maybe when I was seven or eight years oh, old. Right. Um, I took a college course once. Uh, it was it was half the semester was swimming, the other half was golf. That was in Pennsylvania <laughs> where, you know, while it was cold, we were indoors in a swimming pool and then it was outdoors. So it's never a competitive swimmer. Um, I know how to swim okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I know a lot better now, but... Um, I really wasn't concerned uh, about swimming until um, I saw a video back in 2007 of a little boy. He walks out uh, the back of his house. The door just kind of kind of is open a little bit. It's actually, in, in uh, retrospect, I found out it's a reenactment of a little boy. Um, there was a hurricane coming into Florida, and the family was preparing for the hurricane and they were getting ready to evacuate well when a hurricane comes in the fence that is around the pool they take the fence out and put it in the pool in the water otherwise if the fence blow away and hurt somebody or create damage um so the family was even aware enough to have a pool fence but because they were evacuating the door was left open the dog i think went out and opened the door the kid waddled out back he um he fell in that pool and he lost his life that day. Uh, the child, yes, uh, be, between one and two years old. So um, Dr. Harvey Barnett, who is the founder of Infant Swimming Resource, a skilled student, a skilled self-rescue student is capable of. The little boy is fully clothed, blue cotton jumpers, diaper on, regular diaper, falls in a pool. And, you know, there's 
What you don't realize is the camera's underwater, camera's above water, camera on a boom, there's people all around, there's an instructor right there, but you don't see any of that, of course. Um, and this was back before Instagram and Facebook. This was an email when we used to share all the email videos. And the little boy rolls back the float and he stays there and he floats. And the caption is five minutes later, you know, and they cut. Um, and a guy comes and picks him up and a little boy's smiling. And that's the end of the video. But there was a uh, website to go see at the end of it. So, of course, the first thing I thought was, well, that's a, you know, maybe a 12 to 15 month old kid. That's the Internet. That's not real. Like there's something. But I went and looked at the website and found out that there's a program that teaches children to self-rescue. It teaches them what to do. Very, very young children. And I thought, well, I have a quarter acre pond in my backyard. It's maybe 10 to 15 yards from my back door. I don't have a fence around it. It's deep, like 28 feet deep on one end. We keep it clean, but you can't see the bottom of a pond. It's uh, it's murky. And if she gets in there and falls in there, it's the size of an ice skating rink. If she falls in there, I, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to find her? I'm, it's horrifying. I'm waking up in the middle of the night, going up, making sure that she's in her bed, sleeping there, and then just happen to wake up and wander outside and go want to go look for frogs, right, by the pond. So um, I thought I have to get her in these lessons. Well, I researched them. There were no instructors in Michigan. It was a three-hour drive. It would have been a three-hour drive for me to go. The lesson structure are multiple times a week for just 10 minutes a day. I can't go all the way to Toledo, Ohio from three hours one way. There's no way to do that. Um, at the time, I had another business that was doing really well. This was 07 uh, before the um, we had a, a rough time in 2008 with the economy. But that business was, yeah, it was booming. It was doing great. I was looking to do something different with some meaning. Um, I have a childhood friend who's a massage therapist. And I thought, you know what? He really loves it. He gets to help people heal. He does a lot of sports massage, deep tissue. Um, and I thought, well, you know what? I maybe a personal trainer or massage therapist. So I thought massage therapist. I had the money set aside, the school picked out. And then I saw this video and there were no instructors. And I researched becoming an instructor. Uh, there was a training that was going to happen in Detroit. So myself and one other instructor, uh, one other person were going to train. And we, um, it was the exact same dollar amount to the penny. No way. So it was a no brainer for me. There's a massage therapist on every corner. Uh, I'm a guy, so that can be icky. Uh, <laughs> the, the, um, it was easy for me to say, you know what, there's a need for this program. Nobody's here teaching it. I want it. I want to solve the problem for myself. Uh, I'm going to start teaching. So I dove head first, became the first instructor um, in Michigan, grew the business for uh, about 12, 13 years in Grand Rapids. Um, I've spent a little bit of time in the last two years in uh, Chicago with the Water Safety Foundation, CAST Water Safety Foundation. And now I'm in uh, here in Colorado. And I love it. I've taught thousands of uh, kids. I've taught over 50 new instructors as a master instructor. Um, it's a whole lot not like work. Wow. That's incredible. How long does it take for someone to become an instructor? In, in ISR? So the process is basically one session. And uh, so there's some academic work ahead of time. Um, and then a master instructor gets in the water with the student instructor, and we teach a session together. Huh. Um, with that, uh, we take a lot of video. There's a lot of um, academic work that goes with it, the behavioral psychology behind all of the things uh, that go into sensory motor learning and teaching children how to uh, do the things we need them to do. So we're really shaping behavior. It's it's a lot more like dog training or dolphin training or horse training than it is your traditional swim lessons. And I think we'll talk about those kind of things in a little bit. But um, we have to understand the behavioral psychology behind how do we get children to do what we need them to do in a very short amount of time because they're underwater and they're without oxygen. And we have 
two, maybe three seconds, up to maybe seven after a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never let them go underwater for longer than seven. So we have to know how to positively reinforce good behaviors at the appropriate time. So understanding all that behavioral psychology. So the process is about six weeks, uh, plus a couple more for academics. Well, I wanted to ask that so people have the full gamut of what it took to be in your position now, so that when we hear all these life-saving skills, know that there's a lot that goes into it. This isn't just like a, a day training. Right. Um, we, I, I actually, after I became an ISI instructor, I became a uh, water safety instructor, WSI certified, which is American Red Cross and YMCA and those kind of things. And that was a weekend course. Yeah, but still, you know, that just sounds, you know, for me, um, sometimes people confuse swimming and rescue, yes. so, you know, self-rescue skills. And the, the, I just want people to understand everything you just heard him say doesn't sound anything like your local community swimming classes. This, it's is, very this different. is something very different. Um, what exactly are child self risk rescue skills? Can you explain that? Yeah. So we want and need to teach the child how to obtain their own air, how to obtain air using their buoyancy and their own abilities, whatever those abilities are. So whether we're talking about a six month old or an eight year old, you know, those are very different abilities and everywhere in between and all different uh, abilities for each of those chats. So you have two 15 month olds, they're going to be very different. Uh, so we're looking at the child and we're teaching them how to use their own buoyancy and their own abilities to obtain air. So the quick answer to that is, OK, we got to roll back and float. So we need to know how to maintain our float so that we can rest and breathe. We want to be able to put our face back underwater, hold our breath for and move through the water. I'm not looking for a breaststroke or front crawl or any. I just need a child to get from here to there as far as we can get in about four seconds. Roll back, float, rest and breathe and continue that. Um, those are for kids that are a little bit older that are walking. So about a year and a half and older, we teach us swim, float, swim. Um, maybe two years old, depends on the child. But under that age, so six months up until about two, we're teaching that roll back to float. Just roll back, float, rest, breathe until help arrives. Relying on their own abilities and buoyancy. Wow. And so you mentioned six months old. Is that the youngest that you accept? That's the youngest that ISR accepts. It's six months old and the ability to get to a seated position and hold your, uh, hold that seated position. So sitting up independently, we know that they have enough core strength mm -hmm. and coordination to do that. We know that they're able to roll back in the water and hold that float. And do you feel that there, is there a way to help children feel that confidence? Like, because a lot of kids get so nervous about approaching water, or they're overconfident. Yes. About water, tell us how you handle those two types of children, from the ones who are overconfident and the ones who are a little bit more apprehensive when it comes to getting in the water. So we we teach each child individually, separately. I can never tell you that on day one of lessons, here's what the entire lesson is going to look like, or week one, or week two, or week three. It, as as a aquatics behavioral specialist, is what I consider myself to be, is that we're looking at that child in the water in real time, seeing what they are doing and making a decision right now, what to do next. So as far as the confidence goes, I I really like those kids that are overconfident and are like crazy and they're just a wild one because I could really use all that energy and get them moving in the water and, and uh, uh, we can get a lot of work done in a 10 minute session. Those ones that are a little bit more apprehensive and don't have the confidence. 
I'm not sad about that. I don't want you to like the water. Hmm. This is something as a society, I think that we get backwards. So many of us want our children to love the water. I want our kids to love the water. We take them and we, we put them in the water. We have so much fun in the water and we have all of these toys and all of these things that we want our kids to like the water. Drowning is the leading cause of death for kids under five. Ages one to five. Number one reason why your child doesn't make it to kindergarten, because they find water and don't know what to do. And we want our children to love that environment. That's backwards. That's my analogy for that is let's take a child and teach them to play with their toy cars into two yellow lines out in the middle of the road. That's crazy. We never think of doing that. That's child abuse. But we want our kids to like the water where they're more likely to lose their life than in the street. Because in the water, we only have seconds. Let's teach our children to respect the water first. Teach them to know how to manage it. Let's get them good skills. We say skills before thrills, right? Teach them the skills and what to do in the water. Once they're good at it, they will like the water. But more importantly, they're going to realize how, the hard work that it is, and they're going to respect the water. They're going to understand that they have to go and get the air themselves. You know, when children jump in the water, should we catch them? We should probably let them go under and do some things first, and then we can help them. If they're skilled, then we shouldn't be catching them. We should let them come in, come up, get into their float, and now we pick them up so that they understand that they have to fix the problem. They have to fix the situation they got themselves. And in a six month old, do you see, cause you know, that whole myth of throw the baby in the water. <laughs> and, yeah. and which yeah. I always thought was like, yeah, yes, I know they came from uh, an environment. No, but that's not very the same. different. It's not the same at all. Uh, but the, the reason I bring that up is that there are a lot of people who feel like that is a thing that's that, that you can yeah. do that. <laughs> And to me, I always I get that, that. Crazy. I get that comment on social media and on Instagram and TikTok more than anything. Really? All babies know how to float yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's I it's bet. crazy that people think that, you, you know, being inside the mother in the fluid, <laughs> the child has oxygen that is being fed to an umbilical cord. Being outside and underwater is not the same. And no, children do not know how to float instinctually. All children, no, if that was true, drowning wouldn't be the leading cause of death. The only reason drowning is not the leading cause of death for kids under one Mm -hmm. is because they're not as mobile and can't get to the water as fast. Right. The babies do not float without being taught how to float. Probably the number one. The other one is, oh, is that the program where you just throw them in water? And I was going to talk about this later, but... No, we, I, first of all, I never throw a kid in water. That's just would be mean. We do gently plays at the end of the session when we already know they know what to do. And we've already slowly and methodically put them into all these different uh, positions and we know the result, what it's going to be. I'll gently simulate a fall in. There are some videos out there. They're not the program I teach. There's a lady who like she does. She throws a baby in the water do you have to be aware of that and make sure that you do not take your child to an instructor who would do that. Thank you. I wanted, I wanted to address this early because of people thinking, Oh, well, I'm sure every baby can float. So that's, you know, they're already going into this with this skill and that's not the case. Not at all. Yeah. I mean, you take a baby and put them in the water that you, yeah, no, we're not fish. Yeah. (laughs) But I'm sure that's one of the challenges that you faced in terms of, you know, being an aquatic specialist of these myths that people have in their heads when you're trying to yeah. show your work. Most, you know, honestly, most, I, I think most of those comments come from people who are not parents. <laughs> you have your own baby and you've given your baby a bath. <laughs> Or a sippy cup, <laughs> you realize they don't get it right every time, and they choke a little, and they go. I mean, 
you know, that, oh, my kid does not float. This is maybe <laughs> other kids do. Mine does not. No, no you're none right. of them do unless you they're taught. Be a non-parent because when you get yeah. a parent, the i when you become a parent, the idea of throwing your child in the water just is like that was no, never a it's not an option. It never no. been an option in my head. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> but I bring it up, you know, in just kind of because I'm sure that's one of the challenges that maybe you may face when you're teaching a child or it could be like from the parents um what what are challenges like that you've encountered over your years of experience when teaching so some yeah, rescue skills I'm, yeah teaching thousands of kids so i some kids are a lot harder than other kids you know you, if you look at my uh my social media you'll see some kids are very happy some kids mm-hmm. are not happy at all they're all doing what they need to do. They're all doing this self-rescue. But, um, you know, the kids are very active in water. If I'm, if I'm teaching a, a nine-month-old how to float and they're very active and moving around, that takes a lot of time. But I would say that that's challenging. That's part of the process. And, you know, anybody who's a teacher or an instructor of young children, whether it's school or sports, or, that's just a lot of patience and understanding and knowing that, you know, that's what kids do whenever they're in this position. The, probably the hardest part for me is parents who don't necessarily want me to teach the child the way that we teach. And I'll, I'll get advice from parents on how I should teach their child. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, especially doing it as long as I have, I'm like, well, you, you know, I'm pretty good at what I do here. I, I do this. If you want to try, you could try. Uh, oh my God. It's right. The so, full version of stage moms. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, but I, I have an understanding of this. You know, a, a first time mom, first time dad is way different than that mom or dad who has three or four kids. You know, once you kept one alive for a few years and then you get another one, you're like, Okay, we're wait there. Fine. I'm the youngest of five. My parents are like, like, you're good. You're good. <laughs> are you breathing? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, you, eh, that might need stitches. We'll see. We'll, we'll see if it needs it tomorrow. We'll go. But I thought maybe that would be the biggest challenge is m- managing parent expectation. Yes. In the process and trusting <laughs> the process that by the end of this, their child will be able to self rescue. And I think. It might be hard because this is, it sounds like building blocks it the is. way that this is taught, especially since you're mentioning 10 minutes, you know, at a time, right? right? Until, so it requires some patience and, and trust in you and the process. It, it really does. And, but the, I think the wonderful thing, by the time we get to um, about the middle of week two, almost always, I mean, there's always the, you know, 1% and, you know, there's crazy parents out there, but by the time we get to middle of week two, parents are now seeing some real skills and they're usually pretty amazed and they're like, yeah, okay, you keep doing what you're doing. That's many, you know, parents have taken their children to other swim lessons and, you know, we've gone for, you know, a year or two years or, you know, this is the third summer and I just posted in my local community that your child's you know, still spend the summer in their puddle jumper, you know, come to me in October and we'll, six weeks and they'll be out of that forever. Um, the session filled up pretty quick. The Because I know, because I go to my local pool and see that I'm just, ugh. so. It makes you cringe when you see floaties. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it teaches well, all the wrong thing things. It's, about that. Tell us. Puddle jumpers and floaties. Why Why are they so bad, you think? Okay, so let's first address the puddle jumpers, even life vests, in a pool. Okay? They're Coast Guard approved. But here's the thing that almost nobody knows. They are not approved for a pool. The Coast Guard approves nothing for a pool. They only approve stuff for the coast. For but, but they're not even approved for in water. They're approved for on a watercraft in case 
of an emergency. A vessel, right. A puddle jumper is a type of flotation device. It has a type two or four or three, whatever it is now. And that is specific for a size of watercraft so many feet from shore, where the child could be rescued quickly. A cruise ship has a different type of flotation device that they need to have. A kayak has a different one, a canoe, a speedboat, all those, they all have different ratings. The, the life vests have different ratings for what they are for. A puddle jumper that says Coast Guard approved on it, a life vest that says Coast Guard approved on it, are not approved for your swimming pool by the Coast Guard. None of them. Not one. I have on my shelf over here a signed affidavit from the Coast Guard that states we don't regulate any of that. So why do they put that on the puddle jumper? And if you go and look at a puddle jumper, what else does it say? Learn to swim. There's no child learning to swim it does. when they have a puddle jumper on. They're learning that I can put my head up and put my feet down and be vertical in the water. The absolute worst possible position yeah. that a child can be in, in the water. Head up, feet down, bicycle kicking with their arms out like this. This is also known as a drowning position. This is a position a person who does not know how to swim will go in because they'll look like they're climbing a ladder. The faster they move, the harder they're going to hit the bottom. How long could a four-year-old, three-year-old, two-year-old who are in these puddle jumpers, how long can they tread water? No, like seconds, long, like maybe long. three seconds, maybe 10. Yeah. Like it was really skilled, but you're know, like really. And now what? Now we're going to be floating with just the crown of our head out of the water and we do not have access to air. But this is what the child learns being in a puddle jumper. I learn I can put my head up and my feet down and kick, bicycle kick with my arms out like this, and I can get air. When that child falls in the water, what position are they going to go into? The position they know, the position that they always go into when they're in the water. It's frightening. If we think about our own child and what we are actually yeah. teaching them, what else do we teach them? Jump, jump, go up, jump in the water. Water's fun. It's amazing. I have a puddle jumper. It's downstairs. It was, um, I don't know if you know Bodie Miller, the uh, Olympic skier, and um, his his amazing wife, Morgan. I have uh, their child, Emmy, 18-month-old Emmy's puddle jumper. Um, she gave it to me. And that was, she wore that puddle jumper earlier that day. She They went back inside. It wasn't even swim time. You, 70% of drownings happen during non-swim time. We're not even expected to be near the water. And the child had fun. They love the water. They go back and get in the water. I have a video of Emmy, of Morgan. She sent it to me, telling Emmy to jump into the water. Jump, jump. And they're playing. And Morgan's poolside. I believe Bodie's in the pool. But she's encouraging Emmy to jump in the water with the puddle jumper on. It's terrifying to watch this video. It's it's the saddest thing you ever see because there was days later where she went and she got back into a pool. It wasn't even at their home. They have a bull fence around their around their pool. They're at a at a friend's house and they didn't have a pool fence. And then we went back and got in the water and she thought she could swim. And she lost her life. Off confidence. Yeah. I'm so sorry. My heart goes out to them. I, I remember hearing that story, but I didn't know exactly where and how it, how it happened. It's really tragic. It just seems so preventable. Well, um, the, they didn't know. They they actually had a swim instructor who told them that children under two years old don't retain skills. And it was their older kids' swim instructor, so they trusted this this man. And they didn't know. The The first time I met them, it was it was a few months after, two months after. And uh, I went and taught Nash, the older brother. He was four at the time. And I just sat down and talked to him. And they didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't. They they were on a fact 
finding mission, seeking information on how, how is this possible? Morgan was pregnant with Easton at the time, um, ready to give birth any day whenever I, I got there. And they, they just want to know, what are we going to do with this next baby? Like, how are we going to keep this baby safe? So um, I taught Easton and the twins and the baby girl now, and they're all safe. I mean, yeah. You have a big family. Yeah. It's, oh, it's just, you don't know until you know. Well, yeah, that's right. When we know better, we do better, right? That's uh, and that's yeah. that's why I'm so happy to be on your podcast talking to you about it to let parents know what is their child are capable of doing. Oh, that hurts me, but it it inspires me because thank you for coming on too. Because I feel if wherever you are in your motherhood journey or parenthood journey, listening to this it's not too late, but you have to act now to try to find a good ISR program within your area. I wish everybody could work with you, Michael. You're, but well, you yeah, know, there's a there's, lucky ones in Colorado <laughs> and LA. There's a lot of amazing up. instructors out there. Infantswim.com, put in your zip code or your address and you'll find an instructor. Oh, there's Okay. Don't give them the info okay. yet. Yeah, we'll go there yet. They have I have no, more information. Have Wait until you hear more information about from Michael. Wait a little bit. Um, but oh, this is the one. Speaking of the type of environment, so you you spoke a little bit about in your when you started or when the, this came across your lap, your house back in Michigan. There was a pond right in the yes. back. So, do the the skills that you teach vary? according to whether it's a pool, a pond, the ocean, how does the environment affect the skills that you teach? That's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. So water, with the exception of the temperature and the salinity, like how much salt is in it, is pretty much the same. You know, some water is cleaner than others, a pool versus a pond versus the ocean. But our body will react to water the same way, no matter the water. Now, with a pond or an ocean, or, you know, I was in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, we had the Great Lakes and they get rough. And that's a whole nother, another beast to deal with. You know, we don't take our kids by the water whenever it's too wavy. And that's when we put our life vests on them, when we're around water, but not expected to be in water in case they fall in. That's when it, so, but other than that, I've done lessons in Lake Michigan after I've, you know, we'll set up shop on a Saturday and anybody who wants to come between these hours and making sure it's, you know, fairly flat. It wasn't, it was a nice uh, day with not a lot of wind. And I allowed those kids, I brought them in and let them use their skills in open water. And they did amazing. It's, it's exactly the same. You know, the water will look a little different underwater. It'll smell a little different. If you get some water in your mouth, it tastes a little different. But your body reacts the exact same way. So these kids that I have, I have students who have fallen in rivers. And they roll, you know, the little boy's just over one. He's running and chasing the ducks. And the ducks, of course, they're running away. And he falls and goes headfirst into the into the river and phew, he comes right around and floats and dad jumps in and picks him up. The good news is he didn't go down and dad didn't have to worry where he was. He knew to hold his breath, come around and float. And it was easy for dad to get him. Whoa, real time examples. Yeah. Have you had many of those when where students, p parents come back yes, to you and I have say, several. this yes. actually happened to us? Yeah. Wow. I have several. So there's... Those are lives that you saved, Michael. <laughs> No, like, yeah. take a minute. I, I know there and, it's, it's, I love what I do. Look, it's wow. I, everyone's, you know, I'm always trying to, trying to build my business and do better. You know, we're always trying to, you know, we're always looking forward and doing things, but I do every once in a while I look and I stop and, um, I'll probably get emotional a little bit here, but, you know, I'm, I'm friends with, with these families on social media and, you know, whenever, Courtney posts a picture of Milo on his first day of school. I get emotional about that because 
a Memorial Day a few years ago. It's, I taught him at about six or eight months, and then he came back for a refresher at 15 months. And then weeks after that, on Memorial Day, he was missing. They couldn't find him. There's four adults, five adults around. There's three other kids around or how many. And finally, they decided to go out back and look. He's floating face up in the deep end of the pool. Totally fine. And they pick him up, and she has a picture of the family of four. It's him and his little brother and mom and dad. They have, a, they have another little boy now. And she said that that would have been the last photo of them. They took that picture earlier that day. That would have been the last photo of them as a family of four. But, you know, I see him now, and he's getting older. This was probably six years ago, seven years ago, and he's growing and he's becoming his, you know, amazing little boy. And he's in school, you know, he has glasses now, so he looks so much older and studious. And yeah, those, you know, it really hits me. Um, you know, when I go and I, I, I've i taught people who have lost a child to drowning to be an instructor. That's incredible. I teach a lot of kids who have lost a sibling to drowning and then parents are on, like the Millers were on effect planning mission and need to know what, how, what do I do next? Like, how do we protect our other children? And then they find, they find a solution in self-rescue lessons. And I have the honor to teach those, those families and those parents. And it's, it's heartbreaking. So to answer your question, I, yes, I do step back and I do think about those little lives. But more importantly, sorry. I think about those lives that don't know yet. And those every year we have a whole new group of kids, brand new babies, and brand new babies, and first time parents, and new generations, and new generations, and it never stops. It's the leading cause of death. It hasn't gone down in 30 to 40, 50 years. It hasn't changed. So we got, I, I can't worry about those kids that save themselves. I got to worry about those kids that don't have the skills yet. And how can I how can I reach that next family and and give them the information so that they can make a choice to sign up for lessons or not? And that's a parent's choice. And I I don't I don't look down on anybody for whatever choice. Some parents want the mommy and me class. Some parents want the self rescue class. That's fine. I just want you to know the statistic. I want you to know what your child's capable of. You make the decision as a parent. That's for all of us. You know we we make the decisions on what's best for our families. I just need you to have the right information because if you don't know, that's a problem for me. Well, they'll know now. And I mean, I'm just happy to just get the word out because it's one thing. I'm so glad that I look beyond the, um, I wouldn't say shock value, but when you're going through your Instagram and you see these kids doing these things, it gets really easy to share to share, look at this kid doing this amazing thing. And this, and that's what happened to me when I really thought about it. I thought, wait, it's not just a video about a kid turning over. This literally just saved this chi this kid's life. This kid, this yeah. is a life skill. And that's what made me delve in a little bit more. What do you think parents can do? What is the parent's role in fostering this type of um, this knowledge and or a space for it to to learn the skill is it just resources you think it's the problem with the number not going down in this in the statistics is just lack of access I, I think skill? that's the biggest issue is we two things is that what we talked about before is we place such an emphasis on our children liking the water look when when they're seven or eight years old, they have the rest of their life to love the water. Let's get them skilled first. I, I, I'll go back and I, I want to repeat what I said earlier. Our children should not like the water if they don't know how to manage the water. If we can teach parents this, mm -hmm. this fact, your kids should not like the water if they don't know how to manage the water. You don't want them in water. You don't want them to want to go to the water if they don't have the skills. If parents know that, now they can make decisions. Okay, how 
do I get access so that my child can learn these skills? Access meaning a location, a place, mm -hmm. and the funds to pay for that. Now, there are a lot of organizations. I'm going to give some shout outs to the Cast Water Safety Foundation, to Live Like Jake. There's You can Google in your area if there's somebody else, but those two give nationwide scholarships to families who cannot afford lessons. So it's castwatersafety.org and live like Jake. I think that's a dot com. Uh, look those two organizations up. They give scholarships. I don't know that they've ever turned anybody away that need the funds for um, self rescue lessons. It doesn't have to be ISR either, it could be any self rescue lesson. Thank you. Um, it's just, I, I feel that is such an important uh, takeaway. And I, I'm thinking now, I'm like, you know. It's okay, buddy. <laughs> Michael has the cute dog Sorry. in his girlfriend's <laughs> dog. No, it's okay. We we get interrupted by children and cute <laughs> things. It's just cute things. Bite That's or grow. Yeah, my kids are grown. Now, if your dog is not cute, we may have a discussion after. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All dogs are it's cute, okay. no? Yeah, they are. They are. Okay. No worries. Um, no, I, I think, you know, I as we're getting, when we're recording this, because this will be later on in um, in the season, but, mm -hmm. um, well, when season starts, it's summertime. So just as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about all the times I've already gone to the pool with my daughter in a puddle jumper and and just thinking, you know, and I, I think most of us can agree. We look at those things in the water and we, we do feel we we do acknowledge that this is not teaching my kid how to well, swim, you know? Yes. But we still put it on well, them. Hey, look, it's convenient. It's so, it's so convenient. nice it is. as a parent, because if, if you don't have the puddle jumper, now you're in the water, going to a pool with a child or more than one child is not relaxing for the parent. It's fun for the kid. <laughs> we're, this is not something that is fun to do for the parent. I know I'm an dad too. And the, <laughs> the puddle jumper is a quick, easy fix for right now. They can be, there. they're safe right now. They're, they're safe as long as they don't take it off or forget to put it back on after they go to the bathroom or lunch or all those things. I mean, there's a lot of different things. There's well, nobody that dislikes puddle jumpers more than me. I get it. I'm a parent. I know. It's exhausting. There's. I just want to go and breathe some air outside for a moment. I get it. You, you know what's better? A sprinkler or a water table <laughs> or something that right. they can go. You know what? I can sit in a chair and watch my kids in a sprinkler out back for a long I can have a book. I don't have to have eyes on. Even at a pool with a puddle jumper, you go. You still go watch a kid. I mean, you. So choose a different activity. If you're outnumbered, if you're going to a pool with a child, you should be. In the, and they're not skilled. You're holding them in the water, allowing them to interact a little bit. You're there. You're their flotation device. This is twofold because they learn that they need somebody else. Mm -hmm. in the water with them and they learn that i don't go in the water by myself what happens with a puddle jumper you're sitting at the side of the pool either in a chair or maybe your legs are in right you're but you're sitting on the side and they're out there and they learn not only the poor posture we talked about earlier but oh, i can go in the water by myself i don't need a pair on. i can just do this this is how kids learn this is what they do so i would suggest always you're in the water with your child or don't go to the pool that day. There's a lot of different activities you can do that don't teach your child some really bad habits in the most dangerous environment for them. You're right. I, I see the confidence that, you know, the confidence that my child has built from just leaving her in the jumper and watching and I have my, just as you described, yeah. But in the long run, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I appreciate this reminder. And this is the thing too, you know, if you're listening to this and you're feeling like me, like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. It's okay. This is what knowledge yes. we're learning and this is what it's about. And we have to be humble enough 
yes. to listen to the information and now what can we do? It, you have to implement a change though. That's yes. that's what I'm really urging people to do, I, I, myself included. Yes. And look, the fall is one of the best times to get your child into lessons. The instructors aren't in school. Um, if you're, they're much more likely to take a scholarship student. Their, their schedule's open, so you're going to get a better choice of times. Right. Um, find that local instructor and plan on lessons here in the next in the next couple months. You know, and if you can't find one, take Michael as an inspiration and do something about it. That's right. We need more instructors. And, maybe learn. and we need it's, more instructors. look, I I get paid well. I mean, it's a great career. I I love it. I get paid very well for what I do. It's a very specific skill set that not a lot of human beings know how to do. Uh, it's scarce, which means that you can charge a, a good rate and earn a good living. And you you said earlier before we were recording that you look forward to Mondays. You I love look it. forward to work. I um <laughs> I was told that uh uh my my then wife, my ex-wife, she used to say that I I skip to work uh in the morning <laughs> and I say I would always say and whistle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Don't I forget my whistle. Yeah, I love it. it. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell. Now I feel, well, before we give them the information, is there anything else, any one last thing that you feel that you would want people to know about ISR or O2 Swim? Can you, is there anything else that you'd like to share? So we talked a little bit about the process. The, we're teaching children the way that children learn. Children learn using sensory motor learning. And um, the behavioral psychology behind that is fascinating. This is what ISR instructors know. And there's there's other programs out there that infant aquatics and there's, I mean, there's a lot of them. You might have somebody local, maybe they were an ISR instructor and now they're on their own or, um, but it's a very specific, way of teaching that teaches to the child. It's not a curriculum that is based on what I want to do today in my lessons or what, you know, the, the starfish are going to learn this week whenever you go or the dolphins or whatever the, the name is. This is looking at a child and teaching them using sensory motor learning and positive reinforcement. Is your child going to love lessons? I don't know. Probably not at the beginning if they don't know how to swim. You know, as humans, we don't love to do things that we're not good at. Um, I used to be really good at golf when I was in college and just out of college, and I loved to play. Now I'm in the pool all summer, so when I, I don't get a chance to play golf, and uh, I don't love it because <laughs> I'm not very good at it. But as the child learns and gets better, that competence creates confidence. And those children that learn young, I have babies that love it. They're they're floating and they love it. You see it on my social media. I have babies that don't love it. You'll see those those too. But by the time we're two and a half or three years old, or by the time we came back for the second or third year, these kids at this very young age, three, four years old, they start to absolutely love it. But more importantly, they love it because they're good at it. They love it because they don't need that. You know, that floaty is, that's not really freeing and easy to maneuver in. Swimming on your own is empowering. These kids, we see them feel more confident in other things they're doing in life because everybody's making such a fuss over how amazing they are at swimming. Mm -hmm. What I've found is a lot of people see the social media posts or they see something online and they think, well, that's like Bodie Miller's kid who's an Olympic athlete out in California somewhere. That's not my kid. Your kid can learn this. We teach all children. We teach kids with autism. 
Because with autism, have a 160 times higher drowning rate than other children. If your child has autism, you have to get your kid into a self-rescue lesson. That's a staggering statistic. We teach kids with Down syndrome. We teach kids with limb difference. I have a little boy that I taught, Henry. He doesn't have arms or legs. He just says, I mean, that's, and he learned in six weeks. The exact same. He's swimming and floating. Six weeks. We teach to your child. What happens is people, sometimes people see the video and they're like, well, I, I don't know. that That's some phenom somewhere in Florida or LA or wherever. Mm -hmm. But then you'll have these pockets of people. Oh, wait a minute. That's my neighbor. I know my neighbor's kid. He's crammed like my kid does. Like, what you, like uh, he learned to do that. Like, how's he doing this? I know he did it. My kid could do it. And this is how we grow our businesses as instructors. But your child, no matter what their ability is right now, today, can learn to self-rescue in about six weeks. If you commit to those six weeks with that instructor, your child is going to learn to be safe in the water. Oh, now, now tell them how to find you. So, now uh, it. yeah, my uh, website is uh, the letter O2 as in oxygen, o2swim.com, mrmichaelpetrella.com. It's both the same website. My social media is Mr. Michael Petrella. And the, uh, to find an instructor close to you or near you, um, I would recommend infantswim.com. You can type in your address right there. It says find a find an instructor. And there's about a thousand instructors nationwide, probably 900, maybe 1,200, 900 in, in the U.S. And then there's some abroad as well. No, oh, that's not enough. Not that's enough. Not we should enough. have 30,000 instructors. We, really, yes. we should. That's not enough. Wow. And I just want to, Make sure is it Mr. Dot Michael Petrella? I, I think you'll find it. I think it is. Yeah, I think you know. It. Okay, I ha I have to I have to divulge a secret. My daughter, my twenty two year old, um, does social media marketing. She's an influencer, and she does my social ah. media for me. Uh, I'm fifty three, so I uh, I I do my stories and answer questions and comments. She does the post and all the trending stuff. And um, my followers on Instagram and TikTok are from her. I, yeah. So I have like 1.2 million on TikTok, which blows my mind. <laughs> That's amazing. And is this the daughter that you, that actually inspired you to? No, this was, go? this was my oldest that I didn't know about. So my oldest went, when uh, she went through some lessons, we put her in twice a year from the time she was three to the time she was five two sessions a year. And by the time she was five, she was a strong enough swimmer to do a self-rescue. She's out of the number one cause of drown uh, death for, for kids, right? She's out of that right. statistic because she's five. Uh, my youngest was two uh, when I became an instructor. And at, at the age of two, she was about two and a half at the time, she swam, flowed, swam the length of the YMCA lap pool. The entire length passed wow. her swim test at two years old. Wow. Yeah. Okay, now I'm sold. Okay, that's what I needed to hear. Forget all the <laughs> statistics and the knowledge. I just want to hear that. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Michael. I think um, you, uh, first of all, for all the lives that you sh you saved, I know you're very humble, but I think it's an amazing, amazing thing that you've done. And I know you've inspired many of the listeners here to one find ISR in their area so that they can go ahead and get their children registered so they can save their children's yes. lives. Or if you're a stay at home mom, or you're looking for something else that, you know, to do jump in, no pun intended, the pool is warm. Yes. <laughs> and because it's, it's, it seems like it's really, it's really needed. We don't have enough. And we don't. And you know, as, as a, as an ISR instructor, you're an independent contractor at your own business. You're certified to teach this program. You make your own hours. If you want to teach for two hours a day, you want to teach for eight hours, nine, 12 hours a day. That's your choice. You want to teach one session a year. You want to teach 18 sessions a year, all those things. It's all your choice. Um, you make a little extra income, but more importantly, you're going to love what you do. It's so empowering. 
so amazing to be in the water and, and to see the progress of these little ones and what they're capable of. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Thanks I really for having appreciate me. appreciate you taking the time. And uh, again, please go to www.mrmichaelpetrella.com for more information. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was so nice to, to see you and talk to your followers. Our special thanks to Michael Petrella of O2 Swim for taking the time and sharing the resources he did today, saving lives every day. You can reach Michael at Instagram and TikTok at Mr. Dot Michael Petrella and his website www.o2swim.com or www.mrmichaelpetrella.com. And I'd like to hear from you. So leave a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. Follow us on all the social media platforms at New Mommy at 40. Our website is www.newmommyat40.com where you can also submit to be my next guest. Theme song was written and performed by yours truly, composers Boris Tavastinov and myself. Musical arrangement by Yazioko, Yaz Fukoa, and animation by Ellen's Animation. See you next week.